This article is what I would best describe as desperation. There's no better display of desperation, deflection, and denial than this entire written article. I actually went to this article with a more positive outlook because I can have fun and make fun of people for having stupid arguments, but this one is just exhausting. It's like seeing someone trying to build a pyramid by himself while on wheelchair. Except the person in question is Joseph Goebbels. This is propaganda at its saddest and most desperate. This propaganda tries so hard to give you an answer to a question that can be answered by infinitely more reasonable answers that are perhaps the actual answers to the questions to begin with, but since these people are ideologues, they're gonna use alternative explanations that make zero sense and denies all sorts of responsibility. You might notice that this is a really goddamn long video. That's because this is a really goddamn long article. Most people responded to this quickly by reading through the excerpts. I just to do the brave thing of going through this slowly and dissecting almost every last bit of misinformation. And I say almost because only around 60% of the stuff written here are original, while the rest of the 40% are literal freaking repeats. Anyway, the article is titled Gaming's Toxic Men Explain, which is Polygon's attempt to explain why people in the gaming community, especially the men, are angry at certain things in geek culture. The subtitle is Experts Tackle the Phenomenon of Angry Men, Trolls, Racists, and Misogynists Who Hover Around a Video game industry. And by experts, we mean those who have PhD in gender studies, feminism, or any of those practically useless degrees. Unless if you want to write left-leaning propagandas. And make no mistake, people, this is not just left-leaning propaganda, this is extreme left-leaning propaganda. This story is not just another attempt to chronicle the activities of racist and misogynist men who harass women and people of color on social media and in multiplayer games, nor is it an existential inquiry of their particular niche in the video game community. Rather, this story asks, where do they come from, why are they here, and what allows them to stay? That's actually an accurate representation of their current goal, and the answers are actually pretty damn good. And by good, I mean it does a really damn good job at misleading people into the dark depths of the extreme left. This part starts off with Kate Miltner, who is a PhD candidate at Anberg School of Further Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. I'm a feminist media scholar, and as such, I don't believe in gender essentialism. While sex is biological, gender is a social construct. We are trained from childhood to behave in certain gendered ways. Um, no. There are studies to suggest that boys, even as early as 3 months old, prefer boys-related toys like trucks rather than girls-related toys like dolls. There are even studies to suggest that male monkeys actually prefer to play with vehicles while the female monkeys prefer to play with dolls. From what I've read, and it's purely speculation, it's because boys tend to develop superior spatial navigational abilities while the girls have evolved to perceive social stimuli as very important, which is why they're more attracted to dolls. And even if that's not true, there's really nothing wrong with playing with toys that are geared towards the opposite gender. There are times where I play with Barbie dolls with my little sister for God's sake, and I enjoyed it. Just because certain hobbies are leading towards a certain gender doesn't mean that it's wrong for you to like those hobbies. Anyway, carry on. There's an often promoted belief among certain people within the worlds of gaming and tech that this technology is naturally, even biologically, the domain of men. This is unusually based on the idea that men are naturally logical and women are naturally emotional. It completely negates the fact that computer programming was originally a feminized profession. Computer programming was originally a feminized profession because people programming in the 1970s are completely different to programming in current year. Let me show you what I found during my Google Diversity Detector video. Google once provided a chart that says that there's a decline of women going to the computer science field, specifically at 1984, which is going to corroborate the writer's point that there's a decline of women going to the computer programming. Two years before that, Commodore introduced the Commodore 64, which is recognized by the 2006 Guinness Book of World Records as the greatest selling single computer of all time. IBM also introduced the PC with the MS-DOS as the OS. Then at exactly 1984, Apple also introduced Macintosh. Remember that ad that mimics the book, 1984? My point is, with all of these computers introduced and sold to the public, a lot more people are exposed to the capabilities of computers, and it just so happened that men are more interested in it, which is why you see them joining computer science degrees and outnumbering the rates of women who join them. Also, a lot of people who join computer science will most definitely want to develop video games. That and programming is incredibly exhausting. I know this, because I'm in computer computer science too. With the first computers, hardware design was considered to be the big challenge and therefore was considered to be in the male domain. Programming was seen to be manual labor, like secretarial work. It was boring and repetitive, so they decided it was work for the women to do. There we go. Thanks for proving me right. That is before you pivot into other arguments. A lot of stereotypes who was good at computer programming went into the hiring process, and that largely contributed to the computing culture we see today. The women who had been working in programming were edged out. Not only were their contributions undervalued, but the culture they were working in was unwelcoming to women. 
The writer cited an article about the forgotten female programmers who created modern tech. While it is nice to give recognition and credit to the forgotten but incredibly crucial works, something about this feels rather disingenuous and in some ways even malicious. Why should I care about someone's gender when we're talking about their accomplishments? The reason is actually very simple. Feminists or progressives cannot differentiate between work a is intended for gender A, and work A attracts more gender A. Saying that programming is intended for boys is not the same as saying that programming attracts more boys. There's nothing wrong with being a female programmer. I think pop culture has given us quite a lot of them. Every time you write on a computer, play a music file, or add up a number with your phone's calculator, you are using tools that might not exist without the works of these women. Um... Yes, but there's really no need to emphasize that there are women who worked on this. There are women who worked on anything in life. Again, why emphasize them? Isaacson's books, How a Group of Hackers, Geniuses, and Geeks Created Digital Revolution, reminds us of that fact, and perhaps knowing that history will show a new generation of women that programming is for girls. No. Programming can be for girls, not that they are for girls. Programming is a job that just so happens to interest men more because programming is challenging and there's a lot of art and creativity being put into every algorithm, every digit, every recursive function, every SQL query, you name it. There's nothing wrong with being a female who do all of those things. It's current year and nobody thinks that programming should be only for men, especially when you guys are pretty damn influential at telling people about it. And speaking of female programmers, I've talked about how programming is a tedious, exhausting, and frankly un attractive job, and it is. It is a really damn tedious, exhausting, and unattractive job. Ask any programmer and they will confirm this. And if you want to, you can also ask the ladies who went out of STEM due to unhappiness and depression, because there are a lot of them. I'm not saying that programming is not for girls, I'm saying that programming can be really exhausting for girls. Anyway, moving on to the next part, Anita Sarkeesian of all people. The games industry has catered to men and boys for so long, but it wasn't always that way. In the early days of arcades, whole family would go together. Women were involved in the development of early games, but that shifted in the 90s with the super sexist advertising that took place both in print and commercials. Oh boy, Anita. No, it's not the super sexist advertising that took place both in print and commercials that shifted the development of early games in the 90s. It's just that action-oriented games are more popular, and action-oriented games attract the boys a lot more than the girls. And that's why you get more boys entering computer programming in the hopes that they can program games on their own. I remember a commercial for PlayStation 1. There's a man playing and he locks his girlfriend in the closet. He's sitting on the couch with Lara Croft. I mean, what? I wonder, who are you targeting with that kind of crap? Anita, that was a joke. The commercial is saying that you don't need your girlfriend when you have Lara Croft. And by Lara Croft, I mean the one with the triangle boobs, which is only attractive if your fetish is being impaled through the head. So there was a massive shift in the marketing targeting boys and men, and a shift in the games targeting boys and men. Very specifically, this massive industry was targeting one demographic with hardly any pushback or resistance. Because the games that boys love are popular and makes more money. It's simple economics, Anita. Can we move on from Anita Polygon and go to someone else? Dr. Kishona Gray, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. It's always these gender studies that put in their take. Women have been devalued in games. We see the sexualization of them in games. Sometimes they're subject to rape and abuse, or they're there just as a focus for the main character to have something to do. The writer cited an article from The Guardian talking about how there are only 15% of female characters in video games. The article was from 2009 and it cited a study that counts top 150 games from March 2005 to February 2006. As in, one year. One. Year. If that doesn't sound stupid, 85% of characters are male, and yet they are half of the population? That doesn't make any sense! Yes, because quite literally everyone on planet Earth plays video games. There's no such thing as people who don't really like playing video games, or are not interested in playing video games. Everything must have a 50-50 representation, right? The article says that it's the most comprehensive... <laughs> the article also says that media underrepresentation can be an indicator for social inequality. <laughs> That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the non-white people don't have equal rights because video game industry senpai didn't notice them enough. The most bizarre statement of them all is the writer saying that non-white people in video games fail to reflect their real-life counterpart and mainly appear on titles that reinforce racial stereotypes such as 50 Cent Bulletproof? Writer, 50 Cent is a real person. Are you referring to the characters inside the game? Because you're basically saying that it was 50 Cent who makes these racial stereotypes. 
Right. Oh my god. Did I'd rather move on before my head explodes. That devaluation translates to the real world where you have very few female game developers where they are subject to a harassing, toxic environment. So, if you disrespect women in video games, you also disrespect them in real life. Where have I heard about that argument before? The silence of the game companies when women have been abused and attacked is another message that women don't matter. They see what's happening and all they do is put out these stupid, meaningless statements. The article cited another Polygon article talking about how game companies are dealing with abuse. Wait a second, I know this article. I think I've talked about this one, but I actually don't know when. Regardless, it's an article about Polygon asking several game companies the question of how they deal with doxing, threats, or abuse. There are only a handful of game companies who answered them, and the rest didn't really answer. Rather, just because they didn't respond to Polygon doesn't mean that the game companies are silent about women. They don't answer any of the real questions. How many women have you hired? How many women have you kept and promoted up? How many women have you not relegated to making games for girls? Tell me about the characters of women that you make. Are they actually real or do they have huge tits you are implying that women that have huge tits are not real i think you have severe internalized misogyny gaming culture and games companies have been complicit in the abuse there's no way that gamergate could have had the power that it did have without that historical practice of diminishing women the game industry weaponized gamergate a lot of people said well we're not doxing women so we're not complicit screw that yes you are Whoa, 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 calm down, writer. Everyone is to blame for all of this? People are gonna be dicks on the internet. There's really nothing much you can do. You can call them out and they will still pop up. I don't understand why they are complicit. I'm just gonna play this Life is Strange clip. I gotta blame somebody, otherwise it's all my fault. The next one is Soraya Chameli, who is the director of the Women's Media Center Speech Project and organizer of the Safety and Free Speech Coalition. She is a writer and activist whose work focused on the role of gender and culture, politics, religion, and media. Her statements are... I don't even, just read it yourself. I'm not even gonna bother, it's too crazy even for me. The next one is Matty Bryce, who is a game designer, writer, and speaker, whose work focuses on the central role of individual experience in art. I don't think what Polygon meant as expert is as credible as it sounds, but to her credit, there's really nothing wrong with her statement, and it sounds a hell of a lot more sane than any of these people I've seen so far, so I'm just gonna move on to the next one. Bridget Blodgett is an associate professor at the University of Baltimore, whose recent publications include Hypermasculinity and Dick Walls, The Invisibility of Women in the new gaming public. I cannot believe that these people are real and they actually make books with this stupid title. Games marketed themselves to a corner by talking about themselves as being something for dudes by dudes. If an industry segments itself to white dudes of a certain age and a certain income bracket, it's going to reach a saturation point. Marketed themselves into a corner, video games are the highest selling, most profitable entertainment medium in this entire world. To say that video games have marketed themselves into a corner is like saying Drake is underselling himself. I think they're doing just fine. You are also wrong about a couple of points. While there are certainly marketing that says video games are for dudes, I don't think there are marketing that says that video games are for white dudes. The article that you cited is about sex in video games ads, not race in video games ads. Also, you got it backwards. A lot of video games are marketed for dudes because most of the people who play video games are men. It just so happens that video games are more interesting to men than to women. No, I'm not saying that women can't play video games. In general, they're just not interested. Do you see the difference? This paragraph alone needs me two more paragraphs to clean up. But that marketing message for a long time was that this is the most important group and those consumers have largely bought into that. Now that those companies are looking for other markets, there's a pushback from that group. Well, if you're making video games that only cater to a very small minority, while completely dismissing the already existing majority audiences, then of course you're gonna get pushback. But nice try, writer. Nice try painting the backlash as if it's just gamers hating on women or non-white for joining in. They are saying, if we are the most important people to you, why are you suddenly worried about these other people? If that's important to how you see yourself, if you're being told you're actually not that important, it's gonna create some emotional backlash. In other words, screw all of you old fans, these games are for us now. I think that sums up the progressive mindset quite well. You are going to start looking for confirmation for your anger and your beliefs, and you're going to start organizing. And in our era of social media and online connectivity, it's a lot easier to find others who agree. That sounds like projection. I'm going to punch the projection bell every single time you do that. <laughs> Next one is Tom Avila, who is a YouTube creator whose work focuses on the intersection between politics, games, and online toxicity. As a teenager, he sympathized with Gamergate. Okay. 
Carry on. My experiences with video games as a kid were positive. I made some of my best friends through our shared interest in Pokemon, Mario Kart, and Call of Duty. When I was confronted with people on YouTube telling me what Sarkeesian was supposedly all about, and what feminism supposedly wanted to do to video games, of course I was outraged. Gamers are afraid of change. Um, I think you should examine the reason why people are outraged with Anita Sarkeesian. It has something to do with her spreading tons and tons of lies and misinformation, insulting gamers around the world, Many horrible sins. I don't have to explain it to you, Anita is a dead horse at this point. No matter how many times Gamergators vociferously deny it, video games culture has been a boys club for a very long time. It's whoa, not whoa, 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 stop right there. Nobody's denying that video game culture has been a boys club. They're just saying that it's a hobby that interests more boys than the girls. Don't make me stop you mid-sentences for God's sake. It's not too different from older forms of media. The only difference is that older forms of media had had more time to diversify and include narratives and experiences which are more reflective of the experience of a wider of the variety of people. I think you missed the important bit that video games are not always going to be story rich. There are tons of video games with great stories, but most people are going to be in it for the gameplay, not narratives of experiences which are most reflective of the experiences of a wide variety of people. In other words, we need video games to notice more people, especially the disenfranchised minorities. Yeah, uh, how about no? I don't need video game industry to include my personal experiences, because the gameplay would only consist of sitting in front of the computer, typing a lot of words, and shouting in front of a microphone. Microphone. The only people who needs video games to notice their issues and struggles are social activists that thinks that voicing their manifesto in other entertainment media is not good enough. That or incredibly insecure people who have self-esteem issues who think that people should care about them. Video games are on the event horizon of a similar transitional period, yet we've seen this unprecedented pushback from self-identified gamers at every turn. Gamers are afraid of change. They seem to believe that any attempt to amplify the voices of marginalized people in the game space must also come with a suppression of their own voice. I think you have missed the many articles telling gamers that they are monsters, they are horrible human beings, and they should shut the hell up. You may also miss the many times where discussions of certain controversial topics are censored in many video game forums, even if those voices are made by marginalized people. But hey, we don't actually care about marginalized people, we only care about marginalized people that agrees with our narrative. Isn't that right? Why are objectionable opinions so common in gaming spaces? Gaming's toxic men are often keen to display offensive opinions about women and people of color. Really? Specifically women and people of color? I want to hear this. Carolyn Petit is a prominent transgender woman working in games journalism. She is managing editor at Feminist Frequency, where she offers an intersectional feminist views on gaming and gaming culture. She's basically Anita's sort of assistant, so carry on. When I first started at GameSpot, there were men, readers, who responded with comments literally saying that women should only exist in the games media to be attractive to men, and that by me not fitting into their definition of attractive, GameSpot had betrayed this idea by hiring me. They had hired a woman who fell outside the narrow purpose of women in this space. These people who complain are not interested in our perspectives, our experiences, our opinions, but just to be hot for them. Okay, Carolyn, if I am not mistaken, that is you on the left. Now I see why people are complaining. They can say that these are just games and that they have no impact beyond themselves, but the attitudes about women and the roles women have in the world are influenced by the fantasy that games offer. Um... You got it backwards. People's attitudes towards women are not influenced by video games. It's actually people's attitude towards women that influence video games. They have this idea that gaming is like a magic circle that they enter when they enjoy fantasy and then they come out of it into the real world without having been influenced at all. It doesn't work like that. So, are you saying that people who play shooters are going to come out as a shooter in real life? Okay, fine, there are some influences, but since you're being very vague and not specific about it, I think I can dismiss this point as not having too much evidence to back up. The next segment is talking about traditional masculinity and how some men are being trolls on the internet to veer into the traditional masculinity stereotype portrayed on the media. Does that sound nonsensical? Good, because it is nonsense. The people who wrote this are delusional and they have no idea what they're talking about. What I think is happening with this line of thinking is that if technology becomes the domain of women, that puts their masculinity at risk. This is why they are so intent on keeping technology as the purview of men. It's where they see themselves as having dominance and control. That or maybe gamers and men in general don't want to be lied to. Seriously, do I sound like the kind of person who cares about dominating the internet? There is in the United States such an undeniable mutual construction of sexism and racism that it's possible for high-status white men to play off white high-status women and black men in very complex but persistently effective ways. We see that over and over again. 
I have no idea what you're talking about. It sounds like you're trying to make simple problems more complex in order to dodge any sorts of responsibilities. There's a segment here which talks about patriarchy, which is defined as a societal system in which men are held up to the default leaders, and which favors men and their needs over women and their needs. It is sustained by favoring men in dominant roles and women in nurturing roles, and by portraying maleness as a default setting for humanity, proponents of patriarchy argue that this is a naturally ordained order. I agree, writer. Saudi Arabia needs to change. Why is online game gaming chat rife with overt and casual racism. People of color who venture into gaming spaces are often assaulted with vile insults or tired cliches. Like saying the n-word? Adding blackness to anything will upset people. Every time black characters are given top billing in games, you get an uprising from, I'm gonna assume, young white dudes or folks who feel like they are losing some kind of exposure. Adding blackness to anything will upset people? Please elaborate on that with your citation. The writer cited an article where people are mad that they have to play a black character in FIFA 17's journey mode, as in their single player story campaign. Um, why would you be mad? It's just a single player story driven campaign where you play as a predetermined character. I'm very sure FIFA has their own sorts of become a legend mode, or player career mode where they can play as only one player and rise to the top. I am very sure that in that mode you can have full customization for your character. I'm a pest guy so I don't really know much other than doing a couple of research on FIFA. Also, we're talking about FIFA, right? You mostly play an entire freaking club, and there are tons of dark-skinned individuals who are very good at soccer and are hired in the best football clubs out there. Why is this suddenly an issue? Citation needed on the people who didn't like playing as a black guy. I didn't even know how this ruined their immersion. Black dudes around the world play soccer all the goddamn time. I don't see how people's immersion is ruined. Well, unfortunately, I cannot find comments about FIFA 17 players that are getting upset. However, I do find commenters who are are upset with NBA 2K17 story campaign mode. One commenter who would assume is otherwise a fan of the NBA and the NBA 2K franchise complained that it kills the immersion to be forced to control a character with a black voice. How? How? I don't get you. I'm sorry, but these complaints are so little and so minor, it is absolutely not representative of gaming as a whole, and you shouldn't make an entire article signal boosting their tripe. Saying that adding blackness to anything will upset people is absolutely BS. There's a story mode in the latest Madden game, where it turned out that the main character was a black guy. We had a whole bunch of white folks on the internet who were like, well, what if I wanted to be me? Why can't I be a white dude in this game? Um, Madden also have a single player career mode. I don't get why any Madden fan would be angry about a single player campaign that only let you play a specific person. These complaints are so out of this world, they're starting to sound like absolute BS. My answer to that was, why can't we have a story about a character who does so happen to be black? Then if you want to compound that with the actual statistics of who is in the NFL, then we can have that conversation as well. But people don't like statistics, and they don't like the truth. That, or maybe all of these complaints are completely made up and you're just talking out of your ass. I played Friday the 13th and saw how African American characters were targeted to be killed, while white characters were left alone. I challenged someone for calling the n-word, and I got banned. Wait, 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 what? Why would people who play as Jason leave white characters alone? You're not gonna score points doing that, and you're just gonna miss the purpose of being Jason Voorhees. That's like playing a GTA game and not trying to trigger six stars. And even if that's true, Jason is not played by an NPC. Jason can be played by literally anybody. So the story that you cited can only be true if it's an anecdotal story. And what do you know, it's an anecdotal story of one instance that doesn't represent anything. Loads more BS being put into the pile. Carry on. When everyone started this whole multiplayer thing, I was excited. I thought we'd be able to go beyond our small borders. We'd be able to connect, but I've been gaming with the same folks for the past five or six years. Yeah, that's what happens when you play in American servers, dumbass. People have this assumption that the expansion of digital technology and internet technologies will make us more connected to each other than it ever has. It's not really doing that. We're still interacting with the people who look like us. Ryder, it's not the internet's fault that they don't connect people who doesn't look like you. It's your fault. If you want to interact with people that doesn't look like you, go outside and make some friends. Jesus Christ, why do you have to make things so complicating? I don't want to say we're going backwards, but this utopian myth that people had that we would see a breakdown of barriers, that's just not happening. Yeah, because you are too lazy to find friends. Next! Look at the narrative around Gamergate. There's hardly any mention of people of color. It's all about three people who are either white or white passing. 
I am very sorry to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, and many people who are women, non-whites, and non-white women in Gamergate, you guys simply don't count. Why are gaming's toxic men so enraged? Women and people of color are beginning to appear in games as powerful characters with their own agency. Slowly, women and minorities are starting to hold senior positions in game development and games criticism. Why is representation within and outside the art so offensive to gaming's toxic men? Because you're hiring these women and minorities because they're women and minorities. And frankly, that's horrible. You're hiring people because of physical attributes that they're born with and not their skills, their interests, their passion. But of course, it's those toxic men who are the problems. It's those people who are calling them out that is a problem. A new expert on this article is Paul Booth, who is an associate professor of media and cinema studies at DePaul University. He researches fandom in the new media and games. His book include Crossing Fandoms, Super Hulk, <laughs> and the Contemporary thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are in good hands. When one is used to being catered to, and then suddenly other people are being catered to as well, it feels like you've lost something, even though you actually haven't. So privilege absolutely plays into this, both male privilege and white privilege. You really are delusional. For these people, white male is the default mode for humanity. The more deviations from that, the farther away you are from default human. Anyone who isn't a white man is less human. The media reinforces that to the nth degree by placing white men at the center of games, TV shows, and movies instead of showing the shared humanity of us all. Um, we're talking about gamers, right? Not members of the KKK. They're starting to freak out because they feel deeply entitled to this space. Then they talk about it like the last bastion of masculinity. Like, these feminazis have taken everything from us. Now they're coming for our games. Clearly, that's an over-exaggeration, but over-exaggeration is something that feminists do, and feminists listen to the most. This sense of privilege is tied to patriarchy as well. It's not just games. Men are told in our society that they should get fast cars and hot women and good jobs, and when they don't get those things, they attack women who they perceive as being successful. Whoa, 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 wait a second. Are you saying that men are jealous of women's success? These men are all after my money. There isn't a single person who truly loves me for who I am. One of the ways they attack me is by saying that I'm rich. Because I had a successful Kickstarter, they claim that I was loaded and I was a trust fund kid. They concoct these wild conspiracy theories as a way for them to demonize women because these men don't have what they think they should have. Yeah, Anita, about that. You ran a successful Kickstarter campaign, and by successful, I mean it was funded, but you didn't deliver your promises. We are about as jealous of you the same way we are jealous of the Paul brothers. Why do so many men in gaming exhibit a persecution complex? White male gamers often defend their own toxic behavior by claiming to be marginalized. Do I need to show you a compilation of articles talking about how white people are the worst in the world? Google it yourself. If you find about a million results, you're just on the first page. Harassers see themselves as the persecuted group, but when you challenge anyone who feels like that persecution is part of their identity, it just makes them angrier. They're like people who believe in conspiracies. of facts and figures about why white men are the most persecuted in Western society. Okay, and okay, 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 stop. Now this is turning to hating on white people. This own article is its own example of white people are trash compilations. I thought we were talking about how gaming men become toxic, not gaming white people become toxic. And that's what this article mostly spends its time. It's just trashing on white people, trashing on men, trashing on young white men. All of this apparently explains why gamers are angry towards game journalists, game developers, and anything western video game related in current year. Polygon tries so hard to explain this, and it's getting more and more desperate every section. Let me sum up what every section tells us with a sad piano music. This section talks about how young men who are high school students don't understand that sexism is an institutional systemic problem. This section talks about how the alt-right are just your normal everyday people. This section talks about how poor people have privilege. Th that, that can't be real. That, that can't be real. That, that's, 
You cannot be so low that you will have poor people be your target. It's really hard to get people who are making minimum wage and struggling financially to understand that they have structural privilege compared to other groups. That... The... That is perhaps the most evil sentence that I have ever read in my entire life. I cannot believe that someone can be this delusional. Poor people have structural privilege? Hey, poor people with minimum wage, did you know that you have privilege? You insolent, disgusting, snobbish, upper class imbecile. How dare you from your ivory towers insult the peasants and tell them to their face that they have privilege. I think we should end this video right here. That sentence over there sums up everything. This article is written by a bunch of rich aristocrats crapping on the plebs and flexing their million dollar wares by talking about how hard they got it and how the plebs should go screw themselves. My most appropriate reaction for this is me showing clips of Haruhi Fujioka from Mora High School Host Club. Damn these rich people. These damn rich people. I hate all these damn rich people. Can any of these writers top this amount of evil? Please Polygon, try. Try topping this level of evil. Let's see. This paragraph talks about the delusions of oppression, which is about as blatant as projection as you can get. This paragraph talks about how people who perceive others as inferior are telling them what to do and what to say. Not only you are insane, but you have pretty much zero self-awareness. This paragraph talks about how people's perception of the world are shaped by the media. I'm guessing that the writer doesn't really have good parents. This one talks about how a Barbie book shows that Barbie was the software designer and Barbie's male friend was the programmer, which teaches children that computer is for boys and designing is for girls, ignoring the fact that most girls prefer to design rather than code. Good God, writer, do you know how little girls work? This one talks about how media stereotype influence how people perceive themselves with the world and they can influence people with horrible ideas like the men are always the hero and women are only valued for the looks. Writer, I think you are over-exaggerating the power of the media and I also think your parents are garbage. This one talks about how the writer gets criticized for criticizing GTA's humor and the writer complained that the humor is punching down. Boo hoo writer, GTA punches down on everyone living on planet earth. Let me play the saddest violin for your tears. This one talks about how people murdering hookers on GTA feeds into violent misogynistic and trans misogynistic fantasies. In other words, writer doesn't understand how fantasy works. This one criticizes South Park for punching down on people. No wonder you're working on feminist frequency, you fit under qualifications of not understanding humor and satire. This one talks about how the writer gained his humor from Newgrounds animation, college humor, and angry video game nerd of all people, and the writer talks about how those jokes didn't age very well. I'll give you this writer, two out of three examples that you give are indeed extremely outdated. This one talks about James Damore, or as the writer called him, Google Bro, who flat out says, hey, if you fire James Damore, fire everyone too, because they think the same way. That logic is so beyond this universe, I believe the next black hole would be found on your ass. And you doubled down on this by saying, nah, you guys don't value women. Good job trying to please these whiny rich snobs, Google. This one talks about how the writer doesn't believe people who say, we're not saying that women are inferior because the writer doesn't see it in practice by having women in leads. In other words, if you want to see women as equals, you need to arbitrarily hire them through your diversity programs and not, you know, actually treat them as equals. This one talks about how girls like doing maths and they are also into computer science. In general, no they're not. This one basically says if you don't hire these arbitrary diversity hires, then you're not seeing them as equals. I have to give the writer some credit for bringing the best argument for diversity, but that's like saying Crazy Frog is slightly more bearable to listen to than Lil Pump. This one talks about how people who are upset with Star Trek Discovery are also upset with Captain Sisko and Captain Janeway. I'm not a Star Trek fan, but even I know BS when I see it. Most of the sentences afterwards are about fiction, social media, and how they're not censoring people enough. I'd rather skip. Why do so many of these men labor under a delusion of heroism? Serial harassers and men who display toxic behavior often portray themselves as heroic defenders of a noble cause. Whoa, Polygon, you're writing something that I'm agreeing with here. I agree that male feminists for some goddamn reason are always outed as the real harassers in the room. But you're not talking about male feminists, are you? This one talks about protective fandom. What the hell is protective fandom? So they're basically groups of people who want to prevent the fandom from becoming something that they're not. That doesn't sound like a bunch of super villains, but nice of you to paint them as such. This one talks about how video games paint white dudes as the ones who save the world, and that can cause white people to be so entitled that they harass people. 
what absolute freaking nonsense. This one actually gave the examples of Star Wars and Ghostbusters, two horrendous examples to illustrate the prior points because both of those series have tons of bigger issues than race and gender, but these ideologues focus on them because it's the easier one to tackle. The writer then had the balls to suggest that all of this is because Senpai wanted to notice men more, which is about as blatant of a projection as you can get. Why are cults of personality so powerful in gaming's toxic swamps? Men with large social media followings or with many YouTube subscribers are often the root source of online campaigns, even if they don't personally participate themselves. Oh no, not those YouTubers with huge numbers of subscribers again. Now I'm feeling like Gordon Ramsay. Can I show you reviews? Hundreds of reviews oh, no. that are excellent that oh, no. you didn't write that not are from real customers. On the internet, no, good reviews, real customers. This one talks about how skeptic YouTubers frame Anita Sarkeesian as the left-wing version of Moral Guardians in video games, which she absolutely is, but the writer denies it. It's just fabrication, of course. How freaking deluded you must be to say these things, Jesus Christ. This one is from Anita talking about how she received tons of harassment when big YouTubers make videos criticizing her. Oh no, Anita, people criticize you and hated your videos went out to comment on it? Boo hoo, here's your sad violin. She then complained about how YouTubers are responsible for the hate being put towards her. I think you are responsible for the hate being put to yourself, Anita, because you are such a condescending liar. Anyone with a lick of common sense would find you absolutely detestable. And then hilariously, she complained that these YouTubers have Patreons and are making money from making videos of her. I am so sorry about that, Anita. Let me play the smallest violin lane in the world. Speaking of Patreon, if you're still holding all the way to this point, this has been torture to get through. Someone please give me the shekels. Incidentally, thanks for keeping me sane, Samasuku. You are fantastic. This one talks about how many of the YouTubers are old men and that they're a bunch of narcissists. You don't get to talk about narcissism when you're the same people that demand for representation and diversity so that game industry senpai can notice you. This one talks about how these YouTubers got tons of followers and they use these powers to rally against the people they see as enemies who are often women. So, those women do something so bad that tons of YouTubers make videos criticizing them. How awful. How horrible. That shouldn't happen ever. This one says that these YouTubers who are older men give people power and permission to harass and do violence towards women. What are you even talking about at this point? This sounds like the mad ramblings of a drunk person in the middle of the street. Just a reminder, we're in public, so stop acting like a psycho. This one talks about how harassment generates a lot of money. I agree, you have one person writing for you that does exactly that. Skip. This one talks about how there are tons of money being made in conservative media. I think it's because you guys are so goddamn crazy that you successfully steered your average people to the right. How did organized brigades of harassers come to be formed? Leagues form in social media spaces devoted to trolling or a deep hatred of progressive aims. Okay, so we're a bunch of people forming harassers now, huh? This one talks about how Anita understands the struggles of men. No, you don't, Anita. No, you freaking don't. The next section talks about how there are no reviews being made about Depression Quest and Kotaku, therefore Zoe Quinn's collusions and other positive coverage with video game journalists are perfectly allowed. I love how you didn't deny that there were collusions. You just merely pointed out that it's not as bad as people make it out to be, which is like saying, I know that I chopped off your cat's limbs, but at least she's still alive. The next couple of sections literally talk about the same thing that we've talked about. This article has gone long enough, so I'm going to skip into something new. How important is internalized misogyny to this day? dynamic are young men and boys who experience difficulties with women and with girls turning to misogyny either as a face for her life or are we just dealing with a bunch of assholes here? Yeah, the blame entirely goes to the gamers and not the people who started the fire. This one talks about how there are people who say that you shouldn't interracially marry. Who the hell says that, writer? And apparently gaming has been a cipher for that. Cipher for racism? Cipher for not endorsing interracial marriage? Are you on crack? The writer then says, if you put yourself out in public and talks about your blackness or your experiences as a woman or as a person of color who is sometimes LGBT, it will put a huge target on you. In other words, if you make hot takes on the internet, people will respond to it. Just paint the backlash as people attacking your gender, race, or sexuality instead of your garbage opinions. This one talks about how being not politically correct is too exhausting for him. I don't know about you, man, but pissing off these social justice warriors with the most innocuous things like 
anime mascots with small boobs are just among the most delicious of salts. The most amazing thing about being politically incorrect in current year is that you don't actually have to try. You can do the most innocuous things or have the most sensible opinions and even those can offend people. There's nothing you can do to please these moral guardians so I suggest you to not even bother. How can real change be affected? Gaming's toxic men are often hostile to progressive change and inclusion. They deny the existence of societal injustice or unfairness. How do we address this? So now we're gonna move on to their steps and how to affect real change. I think we have complained long enough. These people have really distorted views of the world. Now we're gonna talk about actions. What can we do to address these problems. This one basically says that since we grow up with conservative backlash, you can't really change them. The writer gives this vague direction of growing up in a backlash culture. I have no idea what that means, but I do know that this is really not helping. This one is the writer saying, I'm a proud social justice warrior because I ain't gonna be the one who championed for social injustice. Wow, that is black and white insanity in practice. The writer then talked about representation, and after this exhausting and depressing take, this one is pretty damn hilarious. So when you have tons and tons of people beg for representation, the conversations get diluted because guess what? Not everyone can have their grievances listened to. That's just horrible, writer. That's absolutely horrible. This one talks about how the writer is baffled that people don't want to have discussions about representation or any of the subjects that social justice warriors talk about, and the writer's mind is blown. Why? wouldn't people want to address what they perceive in game culture and fandom in general? Maybe because you are being incredibly dishonest in every single spin and portrayal of it, but carry on. This one is from Anita who basically says that if you're new to feminism, you need to come to my videos with an open mind because that will challenge everything you've ever fought. No it won't. She just spread lies and misinformation about the video game industry, but carry on. What's next? Gaming's toxic men are a result of cultural confluences. Is this something that will pass? What can be done to diminish toxicity? Where do we go from there? Good question. Please answer so I can end this exhausting garbage. This one is from Anita talking about how her videos make some of the developers wake up and change for the better. Congratulations Anita, you made a couple of changes in the gaming industry and gaming industry senpai has noticed you. This one talks about how we need to have more outlets for people to let go of their frustrations. I actually agree with this suggestion, albeit I want you to please find ways to implement this one accurately. This one basically says empathy is key. Yeah, it's really hard to be empathetic for people who knowingly spread lies. This one basically asks for social media censorship. This one basically talks about restructuring childhood education, as in, we need to have better parenting. Then this will be a race, social activist. I will be parenting the next generation of children that will not comply to your BS. And finally, this one is not really that confident about any sorts of change. There. That is Polygon's exhausting, manipulative, and deceptive propaganda against straight white male in gaming, written by quote unquote experts on the field that spew more toxic crap than AIDS. What else is there to make fun of? If you'd like to comment on this article, you can contact us via our email form or on Facebook, Twitter, and any other social media outlets. We will publish the best comments in a follow-up article. Ah uh, yes, you can't really comment on this article, there's no comment section in there. You can only contact Polygon through email or Facebook or Twitter or any other social media. Don't bother guys, your time is better spent on fapping to trap hentais and sending them to ISIS.